Too many wires. New wires? I'm wired. Oh, you're wired. All right. Okay, well, Brother Matt asked me this morning what's the title of my lesson. And to be quite honest, I didn't have a title for it this time. But if uh, I had to, had to make a title for it, I'd just call it Good News. We get too much bad news, you know. And so um, my crude map up on the board is going to show us um, basically where Eden was and where the Garden of Eden was. And ironically, it appears that the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. And it appears to me that Babylon, the city of Babylon, actually occupied the land that was called the Garden of Eden. And we'll, we'll look at that more as we go on. Now there's a lot of teaching is spreading across the country that God is all finished with Israel and that the church has replaced Israel. And Paul calls that a damnable heresy in the Bible. He doesn't specifically name that as a damnable heresy, but all through the New Testament, Paul talks about Israel and what God is going to do with Israel and with the Jewish people. So we're, um, we're going to look at some of those good things. Now we hear a lot about the Antichrist, you know, the tribulation, the, uh, the beginning of sorrows, the lockdown, all this bad news. And I'm, I'm telling you, it has an effect on your psyche. And if you let it, it will drive you to distraction. And uh, it's just the time that we live in. You know, now I am not one that's out there rabidly looking for the Antichrist. I, uh, I do look at certain men that um, could be candidates for the Antichrist. But the truth of the matter is, we ain't gonna, we're not going to be here for his appearance anyway. He'll show up and we'll get out of here. So I think once in a while we need to... Do you remember those things? They had a, a square frame and some kind of carbon and a little sheet over it and you used to write on it and then you rip it up. Yeah. All right, well, we got all this bad stuff on this sheet. We're going <laughs> to rip I'm going to try to write some new stuff on the screen, all right? So, you know, we got in Jeremiah 30, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And people like to quote that verse, you know, that's the tribulation. But nobody ever finishes the verse that says, but he shall be saved out of it. And if you read Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, there is, you know, the rest of the verse. Like Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. And he will be saved out of it. And to tell you the truth, Israel has a glorious future. And so do the Gentiles. The Gentiles' future, though, is linked intrinsically with the future of Israel. If Israel prospers, the Gentiles prosper. If Israel doesn't prosper, the Gentiles don't prosper. And you can see that in the history of the world. Um, when the Jews are in captivity, the world goes haywire. And when the Jews are happy and everything's going well, the rest of the world kind of follows suit. Now that's not a hard and fast rule, but if you look at history, it'll, it'll kind of work out that way. Okay, so the history of Israel is simply provoking God. That's what they've done since day one. Uh, they give God the middle finger. They say, we're not going to do what you want us to do. You know, you're, you're too restrictive. We want to have fun. And, and so the history of Israel is what? Provoking God. The history of God is forgiving Israel. Every time they did something in the wilderness journey out there or before they were down in Egypt and they would provoke God and he, Moses would come and say something like this. Well, Lord, you know, if you kill them all now, what are the heathen going to say? 
you know, that you couldn't actually bring him out of Egypt? What kind of a weak, puny God are you? And that's a paraphrase of what Moses told God. And someone has widely said if Moses and God ever got in a killing mood at the same time, <laughs> there wouldn't be any Jews anymore. All right, so let's take our Bibles and turn to Genesis. And let's get Genesis. Uh, I'm telling you, I feel totally unprepared for this message because we did spend most of the weekend moving and I jotted down little things uh, as we went through. And so let's get Genesis chapter 15, I believe. You know, let's start with Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And so let's look at verse 4. Well, I, I actually, let's, um, yeah. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole ground. Keep that verse in mind because I think there's something to that will be repeated in millennium because when the des he's going to take this desert area, um, this, all this right in here from the river of Egypt all through here over to the Euphrates River, that is Eden. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that as we look at the road. And the Garden of Eden eastward. And we'll see that as we go through. Um, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is, that compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the Onyx Stone. The name of the second river is Gihon. The same it is that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Those rivers are dried up right now. Nobody even knows what they are. But they're down here around Ethiopia. I, I couldn't get Ethiopia on the, on the map. And so it's possible that the Garden of Eden actually goes further down this way. I'm not going to say that for sure, but these rivers are indicative of, uh, of Eden. Verse 10, it says, The river went out of Eden to water the garden. And so the river's purpose was the warden water this area right here. And those rivers are dried up. They're not there anymore. But God will restore those rivers in the millennium and cause the desert to blossom like a rose. And we'll look at those verses as we go. All right, um, let's, let's look at verse 14. The name of the third river is Hittical, which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And that's where all the trouble started. Okay, so let's, let's look some more at some different stuff. We know where Eden is because it's between the river of Egypt and all the way over to the Euphrates River, all the way up here. This is Lebanon up here. I don't know if that gets included, but this whole area right now, you got Iraq and Iran and some of those other countries, but the whole thing is a desert. And that's the Arabs right now and the Palestinians. They live in the desert. So what did God do with the original, original Eden? That was a beautiful place. He actually destroyed it and turned it from a beautiful area into a desert. And it's been like that for thousands and thousands of years. And eventually God is going to restore that area. Now I was asking Brother Mark, and there's a type of that that takes place in the United States. But I can't remember what it's called. So somebody help me out here. The desert in California is sometimes when it rains enough, the whole desert blossoms. What is that called? It's some kind of a bloom. Nobody, nobody, I can't remember what it's called either. 
But people go out there from all over the country. They travel to California to see this desert that's full of beautiful flowers. And it's a picture of what God is going to do when he restores Israel back to its normal Eden. And it says the desert will blossom like a rose. We'll look, we'll look at uh, we'll look at that. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. Just to get a little context, look at chapter 33. And we'll give you just a touch of bad news before you give the good news because good news contrasted with bad is always wonderful. In chapter 33 and in verse 8, it says, The highways lie waste, the wayfaring man ceaseth. He hath broken the covenant, he hath despised the cities, he regardeth no man, the earth mourneth and languisheth. Lebanon is ashamed and hewed down, and Sharon is like a wilderness, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. And so that's the bad news. That's the tribulation. And it lasts for three and a half years after the, you know, the beginning of sorrows and all that stuff that we're not going to be here for, for. Then get over to chapter 35. And this is what God is going to do for Israel. It says, The wilderness and solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Now, some scholars say that what Israel is doing now, irrigating and everything, and they got stuff growing over there, that's a fulfillment of this prophecy. That is nonsense. It, Israel doesn't cause the desert to blossom like a rose. God causes the desert to blossom like a rose. And look at verse 2. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel shall, and they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. That's the Israel. Israel is in, in deep kimchi right now in, in the context of this verse. And God says, don't despair. I'm going to come and save you. And uh, verse 4, even God with a recompense. Now here you're going to see the first and second advents, but they're backwards. There's a lot of stuff that Brother Matt's been showing us that's backwards in the Bible. Because look at verse 5. He says, verse 4 says, Your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. First Advent, second Advent. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lake shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and the way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. This is a, this is a beautiful road. Nobody can go there except the redeemed. It says... The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up there. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion, get it now, with songs and everlasting joy on your head, or their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isn't that an awesome verse? Don't you wish that tomorrow all this crazy stuff would be gone, and joy and gladness would be everywhere? Amen. Well, that's going to happen someday. And so, when you hear about, you know, certain governors siding with the 
violence and the criminals and letting criminals out of jail and arresting good people. When you hear of government gone totally insane, that you don't have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, think, think about this. It's not forever. You know, and we Christians, we have this hope that someday we're going to get out of here and go to heaven. All right, but that's a very, very general thing. God has some things in his word about the Jews and the future of the Gentiles that we're going to try to look at, you know, and finish this lesson today. Let me put this out here so I don't go over my bounds. I don't think I will. I didn't think I had enough material, but we'll see what God does. And so in Genesis 35, we got the, the desert blossoming like a rose, a highway called the Highway of Holiness, and God's people, the Jews, coming back with singing with joy upon their heads. God will restore Israel when he does something. He doesn't do a halfway job. This is going to be a complete change for them from absolute sorrow to absolute joy. And it's not going to necessarily be in heaven for them. It's going to be on the earth. And we are going to partake of that joy. I go over to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah 51. This is another verse, a chapter on the restoration of Israel. Look at, uh, well, let's start at verse 1. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, and he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. And so God is talking about this whole place right now. He's going to make this desert beautiful, and the garden of the Lord, which I believe is part of um, Babylon has replaced that. Babylon's gone, and God will restore this garden of Eden, and this whole desert will blossom like a rose. All right, let me, let, let's go on reading here. He says in verse uh, 4, Hearken unto me, my people, give ear, O my nation, for a law shall proceed for me, I will make judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, my arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and mine arms shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to heavens, and look upon the earth. For the heavens shall vanish away like a smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell there shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generation of old. Art not thou it that cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art not thou it which had dried the sea and the waters of the great deep and made a way for the ravison to pass over? Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain, they, uh, shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall creep away. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> flee away. It's like you wake up tomorrow morning, and everything that's bad has gone, it's just fled. And the whole psyche has changed, and everybody's singing, and everybody's happy, and there's joy all over the place. That is what God is going to do after he punishes the world for their wickedness. And at the time of Jacob's trouble, yes, but the world is going to suffer too. It's, it's for the whole world. Um, verse 11, verse 12, I, even I, am he that comforteth you. And so not only does he give them joy, he gives them comfort. He emotes with them over all they've been through. 
he says, I had to do this, but I understand. And your hearts were wicked, but you had a human heart that's wicked from the start. And I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to give you a heart that will trust me and love me and keep my law and keep my commandments. And you will be full of joy and singing because those that keep my law are the people in this world that are happy. See, we, we have this crazy idea that anarchy brings joy. <laughs> we do. Well, what's our idea? If we can just do our own thing, you know, well, I won't hurt you, you don't hurt me, that's the law of anarchy. But it don't work out that way. But we sure don't want this big set of rules that we have to follow all the time. Rules are for the birds, right? But you know what God says? When you follow my rules, you're happy. Yes. When you do your own thing, you're miserable. And God is going to bring back his rules. We will follow them. We will be full of joy. And we will go on living forever and ever and ever. Now, this is, we're not talking primarily about the church. The church, Christians, the body of Christ has a whole different program. But I, I just wanted to bring some good news this morning because it's not as bad as it looks. All right. Right now, the world has cancer. And the great physician is cutting out the cancer and going to give us a brand new life and a brand new body. But the Gentiles are connected with Israel. Let's go on and finish this, if I can, uh, 1025. All right. Um, verse 12. I am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and the son of man which shall be made grass? And then he tells about who he is and the captives. And uh, there's too much stuff. Let, let, let's go on. Isaiah chapter 52. Verse... For, for thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name is continually every day blas blaspheme. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, and bringeth tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto the God Zion, Thy God reigneth. The watchmen shall lift up the voice. They, with the voice of the ear, they shall sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. Now, it's interesting because he connects the latter part of this chapter with the joy. And in verse 14, it says, As many were astonished at thee, his visits were so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. That's Christ, what he did for us. And all the joy, and all the singing, and all the shouting, and the clapping of hands, and all the, the, the euphoria that God is talking about with his people, the Jews, the Gentiles, the church, are based on the fact that he was crucified. None of this that I've read so far would have any bearing or any val validity at all were it not for the fact that many were astonished at his, at his, at his crucifixion. He was more marred and beaten than any man. Uh, I assume from that that you could hardly tell that he was even a man. He was despised. And when they, beat, when they beat him, they didn't beat him like they beat an ordinary criminal. They beat him with vengeance because they despised him. And so what he did on that cross 
provided the solid foundation for eternal joy for Israel, for the Gentiles, and for the church. Hallelujah! What a Savior! <laughs> All right, I got to finish this, so let me see where I'm at. I'm, I'm doing okay. All right, we're in Isaiah 52. We got, uh, we got Genesis. Let's go over to uh, Isaiah 55. Now, this is where the Gentiles get in on this in the millennium. And it sounds like the gospel of, you know, Jesus Christ. But there is no gospel of Jesus Christ yet. It says, this is the Gentiles. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and price. And so I'm not going to read all of it. But you get down to verse uh, 3, Incline your ear and come unto me. I will make your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations, that's Gentiles, that knew thee not, shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God. For the Holy One of Israel, he hath glorified thee. And so right now, the Jews are despised. They, ev listen, everybody says the Jews own the banks, the Jews own the news media, the Jews this, the Jews that, you know. And all over the world, anti-Semitism is growing more and more and more until the Great Tribulation comes. You will see an increase in anti-Semitic thought and purpose all over the world. But there's going to come a day when God changes all that, and He is going to bless those Jews so much that the Gentiles are going to say, wow, we made a huge mistake. Let's go to the God of Israel and see if we can get some of that blessing. The Gentiles are always listening from, looking for material blessing. All right? The Jews are like that, too. It's part of human nature. But, but this is what it says. Five. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew thee not shall run unto thee. They're not going to just say, well, let's go visit Israel. <laughs> they're going to put on their running shoes and they're going to run like heck to the God of Israel. And it says, for the Holy One of Israel hath glorified thee. And so when God redeems Israel and restores them to the land and restores the Garden of Eden and the land of Eden to its original state, the desert is going to blossom like a rose. Now I said back in Genesis, you know, note that verse about a mist coming up from the, from the ground. Uh, this is just my thought. It's not doctrine. I can't prove this. But something to think about. If God does it again, he can cause that mist to come back up from the ground. And rain will cause this whole area to blossom like a rose, while the rest of the world just has normal rain the Garden of Eden may once again have a mist coming up from the ground and causing lush vegetation, beautiful trees. You may, uh, may even have trees there that are for the healing of the nations later on. I don't know where that is, but if there's a river of life that flows through there, it's, it, it, you know, it's hard to put all the pieces in exact places, but generally speaking, this is what God is going to do. And so, these guys don't realize it. But Babylon, Iraq, Iran, and those nations that are over there right now will be no more. And God will restore that whole area to Israel as a lush area with a garden where Babylon sits right now. I, I think that is part of his plan to restore humanity back to its, its original design. Something to think about. Nothing actually set in stone, but if you study it out, it appears that, that, was, that that's what God's going to do. 
Okay, you look at um, uh, Isaiah 55 and verse 10. It says, For as the rain cometh now, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Let's quickly go over to chapter 60. Uh, no, I'm my stupid phone. I, I'll get down in time. Isaiah chapter 60. And verse... One, arise, shine, for light that is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Verse 5, Then thou shalt see, and flow together, and thine heart shall fear, and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto ye. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephar, and from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. And so to me that's some good news. Look at verse 13. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of also that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. All they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And so all these anti-Semitic nations right now will have a change of heart. <laughs> and God is going to laugh when they all come running to Israel and bow down to the Jew and say, oh, please help us, give us some of your lush some of your glory, some of this. And it, listen, it's going to be a wonderful time. It's going to be an awesome time. And God Almighty is going to make that Jew the very head of the nations, and the Gentiles that despise them will bow down and shine their shoes. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah chapter 60. Verse 15, Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an external excellency, a joy of many nations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. 18. Violence shall no more be heard in the land. Isn't that a glorious idea? No more violence. We're sick of violence. And But thou shalt call thy wall salvation and thy gates praise. The sun shall be no more light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Uh, verse 21, Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, then a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. So God is going to do some wonderful things. And we 
and I include myself in this, who are always wondering what the governor's going to do next, or whether we have to wear a mask in the store. You know, all this stuff is just a diversion to keep our minds off the glory of God and the glory of what he has planned. Listen, what he has planned for Israel, for the Gentiles, and for the church is beyond words. It's just beyond words. And this, I look forward to the day when all these nations up here, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, and the rest of them, are no longer, and this whole area in here, from the Nile River all the way up over the Euphrates River, and the Garden of Eden is reestablished where Babylon used to be, uh, Babylon is gone, will be once again restored to the Jews. Now, right now, Israel has a little country, basically, that's right about here. But their land grant goes all the way over to the Euphrates River and all the way from the Nile all the way over to Babylon. So these, uh, these are things that if you told, went over to, uh, you know, over to the Middle East and said, you know, someday this whole area is going to be a lush garden area, they'd laugh you to scorn. The world has no idea what God has planned and what he's doing. But he shows it to us in his word. And it's a wonderful thing. And so when the devil tries to get you down and said there's no hope, and he does that a lot. He does that to me on a regular basis. You know, I don't get discouraged or depressed, but, you know, I'm looking for something to make life meaningful instead of just being, you know, stuck on dialysis all the time. So lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh, and the God of heaven will once again reestablish the nation of Israel and his people and his glory. And it will sustain the Gentiles and the church will live in the millennium among all these people and all these groups and it will function better than a Swiss watch. <laughs> God's got it all planned out. So smile once in a while and remember that this is not how it's going to end. This is just temporary. And God has some good news for the world and for us. All right, I'm done. Take a break. <laughs>